together for many years. Where you go, I go. These were the words Ida Strauss said to her husband. One of the richest women on the Titanic didn't end up in a lifeboat. Ida chose to stay behind with her beloved Isidore. Moments earlier, she gave her maid a precious gift that probably saved her life. Isidore and Ida Strauss were both born in Germany and emigrated to the United States as kids. They met in New York and got married five years later. The couple had seven children, but luckily, none of them were on the Titanic. Isidore worked for his father's shop in his late teens. Then, he started a china and porcelain business with his brother that grew into the glassware department at Macy's. Eventually, the brothers took over the entire department store and became multi-millionaires. Isidore and Ida were well known in New York for their wealth, charity, and their incredible love and devotion to each other. Whenever Isidore went on a business trip around the States or to Europe, his wife would go with him. When she couldn't, they'd write long letters to each other every day. The couple visited their native Germany every now and again, too. In 1912, they escaped the bone-chilling New York winter and headed for Europe. By that time, they'd already been married for 40 years. They mostly spent time in sunny southern France and also stopped by Isidore's hometown. In early April, it was time for them to sail back home to New York. They normally traveled on one of those huge German liners they had back then. This time, though, everyone was talking about the new luxury liner, the RMS Titanic. They couldn't resist it and immediately bought up some sweet first-class tickets. On April 10th, they boarded the newest ship of the White Star Line. <laughs> this was going to be great! Ida and Isidore scored one of the 39 private suites at the top of the ship. The tickets cost around $100,000 in today's money. Some of the richest people in the world were staying next to them. The Strausses spent their evenings dining in front of a live orchestra in a hall filled with fancy furniture and expensive wooden paneling. They played chess and backgammon, visited the gym, the swimming pool, even checked out the on-deck squash courts. The luxury didn't last long, though. On the night of April 14th, the ship had its run-in with the most famous iceberg in history. It felt like a slight tremor, a little rumble, that's it. Nobody realized they were in any kind of danger. Passengers even started throwing snowballs made from the chunks of ice that had fallen on the deck. The ship officers told everyone they'd be fine. Moments later, Captain Edward Smith announced it was time to put those life jackets on and get into the lifeboats. All 20 of them were stored on the upper deck. They could have had more, but the ship's designers thought it would make the deck look too messy. There was actually a lifeboat drill scheduled for that day, but instead, they had the real thing. Pretty much only first-class passengers were going to be getting on those lifeboats. The Strausses left their private suite and waited for instructions from the crew. A lot of them were still confident. They told the passengers not to lose their passes. They'd need them when everyone got back on board. That was never going to happen. The ship was going under. The crew announced that women and children would board first. The Strausses were standing next to lifeboat 8. Mr. Strauss, who was 67 at the time, was offered a seat with his wife because of his age. He refused it, saying he was not too old to sacrifice himself for a woman. He wanted to wait and make sure no women and children were left behind. Ellen Bird, Ida's new maid, hesitated before getting on the lifeboat, but Ida told her to go. There was still room for Ida, and the other first-class women were yelling to her to join them. It took about 10 minutes to load each boat. That's how long Ida had to choose her destiny. She took off her beautiful mink coat and handed it to her shivering maid. Ida said she wouldn't be needing it anymore. But the lifeboat wouldn't leave without her. Sailors tried to grab her and force her on the boat. Meanwhile, the Titanic's orchestra was still playing some pretty upbeat music in the background. Crazy. Ida dodged the sailor's hands and stayed on deck. Isidore was begging for her to go. She refused to leave him, no matter what. All the survivors in Lifeboat 8 remembered her final words about true love in the face of tragedy. 
We've lived together for many years. Where you go, I go. It took a whole hour for the first lifeboat to splash down into the icy water. The last memory of the Titanic for many passengers was Isidore and Ida standing arm in arm on deck. More than 200 first class passengers survived. Some of them said the Strausses sat down peacefully in two deck chairs, holding hands, just waiting. The 25 passengers on Lifeboat 8 spent the rest of the night rowing to safety. They were chasing what they thought were the lights of a ship. It turned out the rescue boat showed up from the opposite direction. They were lucky to be found at all. Many of the passengers, including Ellen Bird, shared the story of Ida and Isidore with reporters, saying it was their most important memory from that horrible night. A month later, around 30,000 people went to their memorial service. Even the mayor of New York showed up. No one seemed surprised the couple gave up their lives for others. Ellen Bird tried to give the famous mink coat back to the Strauss family, but they asked her to keep it in memory of Ida. The only thing that was with the Strausses that night that still exists is a gold and onyx locket. Isidore had it on his pocket watch. The locket had two photos in it, one of their oldest son and one of their oldest daughter. The locket was sealed so tight, the photos never got wet. Some of the jewelry from the Titanic stayed intact, even after 70 years. The 1985 expedition found necklaces, rings, brooches, cufflinks, all that kind of stuff. One rusty pocket watch they found had stopped at 1.45 a.m., That was about the time the ship went under. A book collector on the Titanic made sure his mother and her maid got into a lifeboat. He wasn't so lucky. In his luggage was a rare 400-year-old book. This collector was going back to New York after a successful book hunting trip. That little book's lying on the ocean floor somewhere, along with the seven million pieces of mail the Titanic was transporting. One letter was written by a first-class passenger to his mother the day before the Titanic went down. It was the only letter written on board that survived the icy Atlantic. It was found folded up in a notebook inside a pocket. Another first-class passenger was a German-born chemist. He was traveling to New York to start his own perfume shop. All that was left of him was a bag full of perfume samples. As the Titanic was sinking, Violinist Wallace Hartley and his orchestra kept playing to the very end. When Hartley realized he wasn't going to make it, he decided to save the most precious thing he had, his violin. He put it in a leather bag so it would float. Ten days later, they found the violin, damaged by water. His fiancée kept it, and years later, it was sold at auction for $1.7 million. It's still one of the most important Titanic artifacts. The five grand pianos on board weren't so lucky. They're still down there somewhere. Divers did manage to recover one piece of sheet music, though. It was a song from a Broadway play. It was still readable, even after more than 70 years underwater. The only car on the Titanic would probably be worth millions today. The Renault CB Coupe belonged to a first-class passenger, William Carter. Obviously, it didn't survive. Carter and his family did survive that horrible night and even submitted a $5,000 insurance claim on the car. Well, it was brand new and all. 